Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dr. Ricardo Munoz, Distinguished Professor of Clinical Psychology at Palo Alto University and founder of the Institute for International Internet Interventions for Health. Dr. Munoz has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Ricardo, for joining us today. Thank you, happy to be here. I think that this area of international internet interventions for health is so interesting. Talk about what that encompasses. Well, I've been uh, working as a psychologist, as a faculty member for 38 years now. And one of my major goals is to make psychological interventions accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, for the first 35 years, I worked at San Francisco General Hospital and um, I developed interventions for depression and smoking in Spanish and English. And one of the things I found is that we do not have enough time to really help as many people as need help. Uh, one of the things I have uh, realized is that our interventions are consumable. Our psychological interventions are consumable, by which I mean that when I do a cognitive behavioral therapy session for depression, let's say, it takes an hour. At the end of the hour, that hour of my time is gone forever. It's gone. It will never help another patient again. And as I began developing internet interventions, I found out that, of course, they are not consumable. They can be used again and again and again without losing their therapeutic value. It remains exactly as it was tested. And over the years, I found that we have had people from 200 countries and territories around the world coming to our internet sites. And it occurred to me that this is something we have to do more. Because the way we do mental health services now is if somebody can't come to our offices at a particular time of day, usually 8 to 5, usually on weekdays, we say, you know, sorry, can't help you. So that already cuts out a whole uh, group of people who can't afford to take time off during work. Exactly. It also uh, makes the cost so high because you're paying for that individual's time that that also, based on economic means, is eliminating certain people yeah. from, being, from receiving treatment. In addition to that, here in the Bay Area, for example, you know, we have so many languages that are spoken. In California, if you don't speak Spanish, you're leaving out a large proportion of the population. Right. So if we can develop internet interventions in English and Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Arabic, you know, you, we can reach many more people. And once we develop them here, we can share them with the world. So you have infinitely deployable interventions. Yes. You have language, it can be any, in any language. You have a standard that because it is repeatable and because it is, it is already encapsulated within a, a system, mm -hmm. um, you assure that the quality is always going to be identical, exactly. which means that you can now compare the responses of patient groups to the standard and you're taking out that X factor of the differences in how they are treated, the, the small um, shifts of how they are treated. That's right. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that an internet intervention is going to replace the therapist. Absolutely not. That, that's why I'm at Palo Alto University. I've dedicated my life to training psychologists. I've trained many psychologists uh, uh, who speak Spanish and Chinese and other languages too. I, I, that's very important to me. And at Palo Alto University, you know, we can graduate about 100 new psychologists every year in our PhD and our PsyD program. Uh, that's amazing, uh, the, the, the amount of psychologists that we can uh, generate. Think about it. Uh, right now, uh, for doing cognitive therapy of depression, for example, the way cognitive therapy of depression was tested, it was with 20 individual sessions, right? So that means 20 hours. Now, imagine that you're a really hardworking psychologist and you work 40 hours a week seeing one patient per hour, which is done rarely. Most people don't see 40 patients uh, a week, but 40 patients uh, a week for 50 weeks, right? Um, then you have 2,000 hours. If evidence-based treatment is 20 hours per session, that means you can only see a maximum of 100 patients a year. Right. That's it, right? You That's can't right. scale up. Two per week. 
50 weeks, 100 patients. That's right. And that's assuming that the person only takes a Those couple 20. weeks of, of, of vacation and doesn't take any of the holidays. Right. The, the, the and sees a patient every hour. And I see every hour. Which is right? deadly. Ding. Yes. <laughs> Next. That, that rarely <laughs> happens. That very few people do that. But so you see a maximum of 100 patients using uh, evidence-based treatment, right, as tested, right? But with the internet, you can increase the number of people that you reach amazingly. Now, the work we do is mainly self-help automated interventions. We do not call it therapy, because if you had a therapist at the other end of, of the website, right, you, it would be consumable, right? You'd still have to be spending an hour for everyone you see, right? Even if you do groups, it still would be consumable. So what we are focusing on are, are self-help automated interventions, which means that people can use them any time of day or night, you know, anytime, anywhere in the world, as long as they have access to the web or access to a mobile device that has an app that we have developed, for example. I think that's what we need to go in the 21st century, to train psychologists. We should not be training psychologists exactly the way I was trained in the 1970s, right? We're in the 21st century now. We need to be training psychologists to use these tools that are available to us now that can reach the world. So in the interaction between the patient and the self-help system, yes. um, there is information that is flowing from the self-help system to the patient, and then the patient is also providing information to, right. the, to the system. What type of algorithms do you develop that allow the, uh, the system that you um, are, are, are using to shape itself according to the response of the patient within the process of, of the self-help uh, protocol? We uh, use primarily monitoring devices, like um, uh, putting in how many cigarettes they smoke per day, for example, uh, how they are feeling, their mood level, the number of pleasant activities that they are engaged in, and then we provide them with graphs that show how these are related. So it may show, for example, then when their mood is down, they smoke more, right? But when they increase the number of pleasant activities, their mood gets better and their smoking goes down. So they can actually see on the screen how what they do affects their mood and how their mood affects their, the probability they'll smoke. I find it so interesting. You have, and obviously can still, be at any university in the United States undertaking this work. Mm -hmm. You can be in other settings, in research settings, in hospital settings. Why Palo Alto University? Why is that the right place to undertake this work here? Aside from the obvious point that we're in the middle of Silicon Valley and we're in the middle of, of all of this innovation, why Palo Alto University for you? Uh, I have been the director of a research-oriented clinical psychology training program at UCSF uh, for over 20 years, and I'm a member of the faculty for 35. And um, I found that many of our uh, graduates from these programs were being recruited by Palo Alto University. It was clear that Palo Alto University was clearly committed to providing good research training in our PhD program. So when they came to me and said, We'd love to have you too, and we will support the creation of this institute for international internet interventions for health. I said that that sounds terrific. You know, I mean, that sounded like what I wanted to do. Um, if you think about it, if you want to get training PhD in in clinical psychology in Northern California, the first place you'd think of is Berkeley, UC Berkeley. They have a clinical psychology training program there. They accept, I don't know, somewhere like four, six people a year, something like that, right? The next place, Palo Alto University, because Palo Alto University is also committed to very strong and excellent research training, right? So it made sense to be here. Talk about the international aspect of the international internet interventions for health. It, it seems like a very gutsy move for a small, modestly sized university to plant that type of a bold flag. It is going to be international. 
talk about that. Yes, that's another thing that attracted me to Palo Alto University. The person who recruited me here was Dr. Bill Froming, who has been developing training programs in Beijing, in, in, in uh, China, and also in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. Right? And uh, they've been doing work uh, in Rwanda, uh, uh, in Ireland, in other places, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, and that international perspective is something else that attracted me because my institute is quintessentially international. I mean, the whole idea of the web is that it truly is worldwide. Right. right. That, that's what uh, is amazing to me. I mean, I, I began doing this work at this county hospital, San Francisco General Hospital. And from that place in the Mission District, which is the Latino Barrio in San Francisco, I was able to reach the world. And here, Palo Alto University was also trying to do that. And so it, it seemed like a good home for, for this institute that attempts to help people worldwide. And we try to do this at no charge to people, right? The idea is to develop these uh, interventions, ideally with research funding or with donor funding, but then make it available to ple people without charging them for, for the, its use. Because those are the people who want to reach, the ones who right. can't afford it. Right. It's also a very innovative way, and certainly a cutting edge way, of thinking about internet type of education. Yes. Um, there is so much that universities are doing in trying to replicate the classroom environment within an internet context. So you see a lecturer on the screen, or you are provided with things that you sort of watch and listen to and take notes to. Yes. But it is not inductive, it is not exchange. It is not, it, there is definitely a hierarchical sense that the person on the screen or the materials on the screen is there to be consumed by the consumer. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a different model. You're talking about a model in which contributors, whether they are uh, people who we will not call patients, are providing information and using a context to analyze themselves and to engage in their own journey. Or you might be talking about crowdsourcing of, of new knowledge, new approaches. You're, you're talking about a, a much more textured type of interaction on the internet. You know, we just published a paper two weeks ago on what we call massive open online interventions, which are inspired by MOOCs. You have heard of MOOCs, yes. right? That's what you were referring to in part, right? Massive open online courses, right? We think psychology and the mental health field, the health field altogether, should be doing these MOOIs, Massive Open Online Interventions, M-O-O-Is, right? And these interventions would be similar to MOOCs in that they would be open to anyone in the world. They would be free, ideally. And they would offer the best that, that in this case, universities offer in terms of MOOCs and health care providers would offer in terms of MOOIs. But you're also creating a new community so you're also creating a connection amongst people where yes. information can be exchanged, experiences can be exchanged, yes. and perhaps even the context in which these exchanges take place can be improved by the community itself. Yes, giving information and support to each other. So it's not based only on what the professional can provide, right. but what other people who are in the same kind of situation are trying to do. In terms of the evolution of Palo Alto University, over the next years, you're going to be placing increasing evidence on undergraduate students. Will that have an impact on what you're doing and what your department is doing? To answer that, uh, let me uh, describe the progression of, of my career. I, for the first, I'd say, 20 years, I was focusing primarily on teaching therapists to do face-to-face -face therapy. For the next 15, focusing on developing these internet interventions that go out to the entire world. What I'd like to do in the next stage of my career here at Palo Alto University is try to combine the two. And that would bring in undergraduates, master's level people, as well as PhD students, right? So uh, what I foresee is the use of these uh, digital health tools to be not only given out to the world, but also to be able to be used by providers at different levels of training. 
not just PhD therapists, but, but also master's level therapists, and maybe even undergraduates who could help as uh, behavioral assistants, let's say. Also, the younger people bring in a different sensibility yes. around these t the use of these tools and might contribute in ways that to their people, creation. You know, to their creation. Yes. Five, five years, being five years older or 10 years older, it makes a big difference nowadays in how people look at these tools. Absolutely, yes. So we could have undergraduates become part of our team. Some of them already know how to create websites or apps and things like that. And they'd love to be able to do that to help people. Dr. Ricardo Munoz, thank you so much for sharing your work here at Palo Alto University with us. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thanks.